decided to change my ways. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden Podcast. We are here. We are your hosts, Sadie Carpenter, cult expert, cult survivor, Sadie Carpenter, the one, the only, is here with you today. And my name's Gabrielle Hakoen. How are you doing today, Sadie? I'm doing fantastic. I'm really excited about our topics for today. Backing like when we did our Well to Hell episode last fall, we thought that was a lot of fun. Religious hoaxes are a lot of fun. And we decided that maybe we'd do three of them in an episode for April Fool's Day. Yeah. And the more I got into this, like the more fun it was. We've talked about a lot of hoaxes and grifters people wise like john todd or mike warnke or alberto rivera but the well to hell hoax was not centered around one person and that led me down a whole string of other similar christian hoaxes through the years and i guess i i said religious hoaxes but yeah we are mostly talking about christian hoaxes here well my the the third one i'm doing is uh catholic which is Oh, mine's Catholic too. Oh, yeah. So the IFB would say it's not Christian. <laughs> do we want to tell them what the hoaxes are? Or do we want to just like leave it to? Uh, uh... Let's let it unfold as we as we go through the episode. <laughs> okay, so you've got one in the first segment. I've got one in the second segment, and then you've got another one in the third segment. That's how we're going to do this. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, but before we get into that, the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host, cult expert, cult survivor, Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult, the cult in which she was raised. Uh, on this podcast, we talk about this cult. We talk about other cults. We talk about religion. We talk about fundamentalism. We talk about the real and present threats that cult and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole. And it is our goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you are a fan of our show, then there are some things that you can do in order to support us you can join our patreon patreon.com slash leaving eden podcast you get access to extended uncensored ad free versions of most of our episodes as well as uh they come out a couple days early so they come out you can listen to them over the weekend instead of waiting for monday we've also got a couple of bonus episodes on there um one where we review a uh a, a marriage book by Jack Scop. We've got one where we review a fundy sex book from like a year ago. Every so often we come out with a bonus episode and that goes up on the Patreon. So you can find that at patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. You can also uh, join our Facebook group and our subreddit. Both of those are called Eden Exodus. Great places to have discussion about the show um, or about things that you hear about on the show, just general religious topics. In general, people there tend to be pretty respectful of one another, which is good. That's not something that can be said for all places on social media. That's positive, I guess, if you want to join in that discussion. Facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus and Reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. I guess I'm going to thank the patrons here unless there's anything else. Let's thank the patrons. All right, we have our I gave it all to your patrons. Your names are I'm not 1010, Kathleen Moncrief, Melissa Manown, Melora King, and Todd Dale on behalf of his lovely deconstructorine ex of a spouse, Madeline Antrim. Thank you guys so much. I wonder who that person is if they are not 1010. If they're not 1010, they're 1111 or 99. It goes to 11. <laughs> yeah, it goes up to 11, just like Spinal Tap. Just rewatched that. <laughs> Great movie. Fantastic movie. I love that one. I, I especially love the Stonehenge scene where they lower down the Stonehenge and it's tiny. I love everything with Janine because that's who I like to pretend to be when my husband has a gig. <laughs> Can't play that's heavy cute. metal and doubly. No. Our Faith Promise Missions to your patrons, your names are Allie Allen, Autumn of Our Discontent, Brittany, Crystal Walker, Dora J, Hannah Ross, Hannah Montana, Hope Norum, Horton Here's a Shane, Janine Collin, Jana Connor, Jen Kaharski, Jessica Tambo, Jonna, Junie B. Jones, and the B stands for Back on My Bullshit, Kat Henwood, K. Terwee, Kristen Marie, Learned Vixen, Linda Morgan, Madeline Antrim, Madeline Cusick, Marlena Stuve, Mary Martin, Megan Arendt, 
Melissa G, Morgs, Rob the Methodist, Stephanie Johnson, Steve and Amy, Susie, Tara McNamara, and Wes the Cowboy. Thank you guys so much. We love you so much. Thank you so much for supporting our show on Patreon. And a big thank you to everyone who supports us there and everyone who contributes in non-financial ways, being active in our Facebook group and sharing us on social media, leaving us positive reviews and mentioning us to friends and family and subscribing on whatever podcast platform you use. All of those things directly contribute to us having a show and us having a platform. And we are thankful for all of it. In general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, and PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical, and sexual abuse, and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we will mention at least a few of these topics, but we try to avoid any graphic detail unless it's relevant to the story that we're telling, and we try to give the audience a heads up before we go into detail. This episode has a lot of fun sci-fi and ghost story stuff, but the final segment also contains discussion of mental health disorders, eating disorders, and self-harm. We will give an additional trigger warning before we get into that. So the first Christian hoax that we're getting into, so Sadie has this one highlighted here for me. I haven't read this one yet. Um, we've kind of prepared these in private, and then we're going to tell them to each other, get some live reacts to them. So this should be fun. This is going to be really fun. So do you want to introduce this hoax to me? Yes. So this hoax was actually referenced in an offhanded way in an article that we read about the well to hell. In the early 1970s, the same era as I wish we'd all been ready and the thief in the night and the Jesus movement, a much older urban legend was resurrected. Pun intended. The legend of the vanishing hitchhiker is one of the broadest urban legends in the world. It can be found as far back as the 1870s in America, but it goes back at least 400 years in Sweden and probably hundreds and hundreds of years in other countries and cultures as well. So this was a deep rabbit hole and this is for patrons. But while I was researching this, I came across a bit about Mother Cabrini. You may remember Mother Cabrini because a listener whose sister is a nun wrote in to share the Mother Cabrini parking prayer, which is Mother Cabrini, Mother Cabrini, find me a spot for my little machini. Well, while I was reading about Mother Cabrini because I got on a rabbit trail and she's a fun saint to read about, I found some other unusual patron saints (laughs) and I found out that St. Thomas Aquinas is the patron saint of not getting struck by lightning. (laughs) What? It has absolutely nothing to do with our episode today, but I thought that was so fun. I had to include it. I mean, I'm sure if one of the saints had been struck by lightning, they would have turned him him or her into the patron saint of electricity, like uh, Benjamin Franklin or something. Folklorists Richard Beardsley and Rosalie Henke were the first to formally study the vanishing hitchhiker urban legend in the early 1940s. What Beardsley and Hanky did is they collected a sample of these legends from around the country, and then they categorized them into four most common variations. So the base of the story to qualify as a vanishing hitchhiker story, a person is traveling on a road, they are in some kind of conveyance. So they're either driving a car in a modern telling or in an older version They are in a buggy or in a wagon. The driver is almost always portrayed as a man. And the hitchhiker he sees on the side of the road is almost always portrayed as a woman. Although this is where it splits into two versions. Because sometimes the hitchhiker is a beautiful young woman. And sometimes the hitchhiker is a very, very elderly woman. So that's that's the beginning. It, It always starts the same way. In some variations, the woman gives an address and asks to be taken to that address. And then later it is revealed that she has been long dead. So like the hitchhiker or the uh, the driver drives her to the address and then he turns around to open the car door for her and she's gone. And he goes and knocks on the door and says, does a young woman live here? And her name, she told me her name is Betty and she disappeared. And the person at the house says, Betty's been dead for 20 years. Uh, In other variations, the hitchhiker borrows something like a coat or an umbrella from the driver and then disappears. And then that item is later found on her gravestone. 
in some variations, the hitchhiker just disappears from the back seat without a trace, no, no answer. She's just gone. And often when the hitchhiker is portrayed as an older woman, she warns about a disaster that's about to happen before she disappears. Side note, this urban legend and especially a couple different versions of it are really big around Chicago. The old lady warning one, there was a version around the Chicago World's Fair warning that the World's Fair was going to be a disaster. That one is really popular in Chicago, but there are local variations and differences from all around the country and all around the world. I think I've heard this story as like a, a, around a campfire. You know, yes. if you go camping, somebody's telling a ghost story. I mean, I think there was even a Twilight Zone episode from back in the Most 60s. Likely. Yeah, that, that was something like this, you know. This is a really, really common urban legend. Beardsley and Hanky noted that one established but less common variation of the story saw the hitchhiker revealed in the end to be a local religious figure. So, a story from Kingston, New York in 1941 had the hitchhiker turn out to be Mother Cabrini, um, who was a, for those who don't subscribe to Patreon, who was a Catholic uh, saint and local hero in that area. Very well known in New York City. And, and that brings us to my topic for today, because in the early 1970s, we get the Jesus version of this. In 1974, the New York Times published an article about Dr. Lydia M. Fish, who taught anthropology at Buffalo State College. I looked up Dr. Fish as well because it was a rabbit hole kind of day, and she is now Professor Emerita at Buffalo State. She has had a really interesting career. It was a little bit inspiring, the stuff she has done in her lifetime. Anyway, Dr. Fish at the time was starting to hear about the Jesus version of the vanishing hitchhiker legend specifically on the New York Thruway. So she hmm. started having her anthropology students take note whenever they heard it and archive the different versions of this legend, just like Beardsley and Hanky did with the original Vanishing Hitchhiker legend. So the very first account that Dr. Fish heard, I'm quoting from the New York Times here, a couple driving along the New York Thruway picked up a beautiful young hippie clad in shining white. He sat in the back seat and buckled his seatbelt. He began to talk about religion and asked them if they believed in the second coming. When they turned to answer him, he had vanished, leaving his seatbelt fastened. When they left the throughway, they told the toll collector that they had lost a hitchhiker. He told them not to worry. At least a dozen had come through the gate that day with the same story. Wow. So Dr. Fish's students very quickly pulled together 60 accounts of the same story in the same geographical area. So 60 people telling the same story. And they'll say, you know, it'll be somebody saying it happened to my brother or it happened to my, my cousin's nephew or I'm connected. It didn't happen to me, but it happened to somebody that I'm connected to. Right. And because the guy at the toll booth is saying, oh, well, I've heard that happen. Everyone's saying, well, yeah, I know someone. That's exactly. so interesting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it's it's the same way that the vanishing hitchhiker story would would spread. You wouldn't say this thing happened to me, but you'd say it happened to my uncle, or it happened to my grandpa, or it happened to my next door neighbor's friend. And the the Jesus hitchhiker story was spreading exactly in the same way. There are similarities and differences from the original vanishing hitchhiker urban legend. In every single case of the Jesus hitchhiker story, the hitchhiker was a man, which is very different from the versions 25 or 30 years earlier, in which the hitchhiker was almost 100% of the time portrayed as a woman. In this version of the story, the physical description of the hitchhiker is pretty consistent. There are two ways that it's told. It's always, he looks like a hippie, he has a beard, and he has long hair. And they will either say dressed all in shining white clothing or dressed casually in blue jeans. It's very clear that the popularity of the Jesus hitchhiker urban legend coincided perfectly with the Jesus movement and the interest in the rapture that spawned things like A Thief in the Night and books and movies and music that are similar to that. It's easy to see also how the Jesus version was influenced by earlier versions of the same urban legend. So one thing that stuck out to me was 
a common but not universal part of the vanishing hitchhiker legend was the hitchhiker either taking something from the driver or leaving something in the car. And this early Jesus version specifies very clearly that the seatbelt was left buckled. So that is a direct tie to Beardsley and Hanky's vanishing hitchhiker le- legend. There is also, as I mentioned, one Highly common but not universal variation of the original legend has the hitchhiker making prophecies about the future or saying something bad is about to happen. And that is also echoed here with the Jesus hitchhiker talking about the end times. So it's neat because it's Hmm. so you can see how it descended from the earlier legend. This is so fascinating, though. I'm glad that uh, Professor Fish, Dr. Fish. Mm -hmm heard this and said i want you to write all this stuff down that somebody was actually paying attention she's really cool really cool you should look up her work she's really i'll have to uh i felt very inspired looking into what she's done so it we can definitely see how the jesus hitchhiker legend is directly descended from the original urban legend but what might not be as obvious to people who aren't christians or aren't familiar with the new testament is that the Jesus version of the Vanishing Hitchhiker legend is directly inspired by scripture as well. In Luke chapter 24, we read a story about something that happened the same day as the resurrection of Jesus. As the resurrection of Jesus, two disciples of Jesus, one is unnamed, the other is named Cleopas, were walking from Jerusalem to a city called Emmaus, which is about 7 miles away. A stranger came up and walked beside them and asked them why they seemed so sad. They explained to the stranger that their prophet Jesus had been crucified, but now his tomb was empty. They were confused. They couldn't figure out what had gone on. Had someone stolen his body? What's going on? The stranger started to explain to them the entire scriptures, speaking very passionately and explaining scripture to them in a way that they had never heard before. When the end of the day was coming, the disciples asked the stranger to stay and have dinner with them. And he did. He took bread at dinner and said a blessing and served them the bread. And that's when they recognized that the stranger had been Jesus all along. And then he suddenly disappeared. For those not familiar with Christian mythology, the appearing and disappearing is very much a canon thing that Jesus could do in the short time between when he died and when he was resurrected. And then when he was assumed into heaven, uh, 40 days, 40 days assumption, 40 days Pentecost, you know the drill. It leads to speculation about how. He could do that? Like, was he in the spiritual body that we will have after we go to heaven? That sort of thing. Because Jesus on earth between resurrection and assumption is described as corporeal, very physically there, not like most ghost descriptions. Like, you could touch him and feel, you could shake his hand and feel his hand. But he's also described as walking through walls and appearing and disappearing quickly. So, and and this is kind of accepted Christian mythology and leads to a lot of speculation about what our physical forms may be like in heaven. But the basic, the basic part of this story is that uh, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus appeared and then disappeared. The Jesus version of the vanishing hitchhiker story is really interesting because you can directly trace it to scripture and the classic urban legend because it has elements of both. Well, I've also heard Christian parables where Jesus will appear on the street to people or somebody will appear on the street and that person will turn out to be Jesus. Like one Mm -hmm. example that I'm thinking of, uh, I want to say about 10 years ago, Kendrick Lamar, who a very talented rapper came out with an album called to pimp a butterfly. And one of the songs on that album is called how much a dollar cost. And in the song, Kendrick is, you know, he's he's very rich, he's very successful, he's a very wealthy rapper, and a homeless man asks him for some money, and he turns the guy down, and it turns out that the homeless guy was Jesus. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a very common parable that I've heard, you know, multiple times. I've heard there be versions of it where somebody went and helped out a homeless person, and mm-hmm. then that homeless person turned out to be Jesus and said, you just did... And the the lesson is how you what you do to the least of humanity you do to me and Mm -hmm. said, you know, I was a a, a poor beggar and you treated me with kindness. Therefore, you treated Jesus with kindness, treat everyone with kindness. Right. And that's directly from scripture. That's from Matthew chapter 25. I just looked it up real quick. 
I've listened to a lot of uh, sermons over the course of doing the show, and that's like a parable that comes up quite a bit. And then the IFB proceed to ignore it <laughs> half the time. Um, <laughs> but we'll teach a man to fish that what they should do is they should get the homeless guy who turns out to be Jesus enrolled in an MBA program so that he can <laughs> get his business degree and start. I don't know, being capitalist Jesus. <laughs> Robber Baron Jesus. <laughs> Robert Kiyosaki Jesus. No, I said, well, it could be Robert Kiyosaki Jesus. I was saying Robber Baron Jesus or Dave Ramsey oh, okay. Jesus, you know, like. Yeah. Uh, I, my, my school did a play that was along these lines, an old man, something, something, praying on Christmas and. But something, something asked Jesus to come have Christmas dinner with him or something. And um, I don't think it was a very good play. But first, like, a, a homeless lady shows up at his door and she needs help. And then, like, an old man shows up at his door and needs help. And then, like, a child shows up at his door and needs help. And then he's complaining to Jesus about, why didn't you come eat Christmas dinner with me? And Jesus says, I ate Christmas dinner with you three times for I was in all of those people who visited you. I mean, that's a good lesson, though. It is. I just didn't think it was very well written. <laughs> I I remember not being a fan at the time. It's it's yeah. church theater. Uh and it was I don't know, I did get to do my favorite Patch the Pirate. My hey, two there's favorite. that. The Jesus Hitchhiker legend had this this string of popularity in the early 70s coinciding with the Jesus movement and then it came back around again in 1998 and 1999 because of the renewed rapture panic around Y2K and like the the huge evangelical buildup to Y2K is wondering, is the rapture going to come? So there is an element in the story from the 70s where the hitchhiker warns, says, do you believe in the end times or do you believe Jesus is coming back and then disappears? The versions that are going around in the 90s, the hitchhiker gave much more specific warnings about the end times or even preaches a whole sermon about what's going to happen in the end times and the judgments to come before disappearing. I would love to do an episode where we talk about the build up to Y2K and like the, you know, we could talk about the religious aspects of it. We could talk about all the other aspects of it and like what it actually was. But I think, yeah, I think we need somebody like slightly older because I remember it, but I was such a little kid. Right. I remember hearing, oh, Y2K, the computers are going to flip and something. And then yeah. yeah. And and I know that there are a lot of fundamentalists that got super preppy over that. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't doubt it. I knew I think this is anonymized enough. I knew one family who in 2014 were still using up the toilet paper that they bought for Y2K. Oh man, too bad they didn't save any for COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and still eating out of their prepper shelves from 20 year old dry beans. I mean, at least they didn't, you know, just keep the prepper, like, just keep that stuff down there. At least they're like, well, we got it. At least we bought it all, you know, years in advance. And we're just like, if beans are cheap, it's like buying futures, you know, the the, the beans futures yeah. market. If you, if you have the money to invest, I mean, invest now. It's shelf stable. Dave Ramsey would be proud. Do you have any theories about where the sort of jump to this being an urban legend to it being a Christian urban legend came from? I don't. And Dr. Fish didn't really either, which I thought made this so interesting. I thought this was a neat one to talk about because it's not something that we can debunk or partially debunk like the well to hell hoax, because it's literally just a ghost story. It's not, there's no way to track or debunk it. Um, but I thought it was so worth talking about because it takes a much older urban legend and marries it with scripture and it becomes something totally new. It's like a, a whole new life for this urban legend. Do you know what my theory is? What? My theory is that it was a sermon illustration that was not intended to be like a literal, this is an actual thing that actually happened. Or maybe it was if it was a, a pastor who was manipulative enough. But it seems like it's the type of thing that you would hear about in a sermon illustration or like as like a parable or as being entirely metaphorical. And then somebody hears that and takes it like literally and says, well, I heard it from my pastor, so it must be 100% true. 
That is a pretty good theory, I think. I think that's possible. There's probably a couple of other places where it could or it could have just like come from. I actually do have another theory, but I'm not going to tell you what it is until I'm done talking about the other thing I'm going to talk about. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. All right. So uh, let's take up the offering. Let's hear about your hoax. Uh, I'm excited. Excellent. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, that group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. We are back from our break. We are talking about Christian hoaxes, uh, sort of urban legends hoaxes. While Sadie's hoax that uh, of, of the hitchhiker Jesus is... If you're a believer, that's almost somewhat believable. If you believe in Jesus, then, you know, it seems like it could be almost plausible that Jesus would come down and talk to people on earth. This is a hoax that is so ludicrous and so ridiculous that I don't know why or if anybody ever actually believed this one. But I am talking about the chronovisor. Would you like to hear about the chronovisor, Sadie? Absolutely. So the story of the chronovisor dates back almost, I feel silly just saying it. The story of the chronovisor dates back almost 100 years. Marcello Pellegrino Ernetti was a Benedictine priest who, uh, he was born in 1925 in the area around Rome. In 1941, at the age of 16, he joined a monastery as a postulant. And eight years later, he was ordained as a Benedictine priest. And throughout the mid-century, he made quite a name for himself. He was highly accomplished as a musicologist, well-known for his mastery of Gregorian chant. Also, he was a gifted exorcist. Oh, fun. Yeah, uh, we love a good exorcist story on this show. So, that's fun. According to one source, he performed thousands of exorcisms in Italy during his tenure, and he was very well known for it. Because he had such prodigious skill as an exorcist, he claimed to know the devil and his minions very well, and even purportedly having interviewed of him about his likes and dislikes, from which he Wait, interviewed him, interviewed the devil, interviewed the devil, and then transcribed okay. them down into a paper that he published called "The Likes and Dislikes of the Devil." Okay. Yeah. So among the devil's likes, he includes the miniskirts with which I ensnare men and women and I fill up my kingdom. The television, it is my device. I invented it in order to destroy the single souls and the families. I separate them. I break them up with my subtle penetrating programs. And the discotheques, divorce, abortion, drugs, and above all, I like and am delighted by those bishops and priests who deny my existence and my work in the world so the devil's a big fan of everyone who thinks the devil isn't real because it allows him to move undercover he also really loves the disco i guess big fan of donna summer and her hits so the devil is like really really apathetic towards me because i have no idea whether the devil exists or not and am not really focusing on that issue at this point in my life yeah so the devil is very ambivalent about you sadie really does not care about that. I mean, that's that's probably fine. No, here's the thing. Do you, have you ever worn a miniskirt? Yes, recently. Devil loves you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just like, it's not that I, it's not that I, you know, feel that badly about the devil <laughs> loving me. It's that I think that's a, I think that's too easy. Well, do you want to know what the devil doesn't like? Maybe you can make some, some, uh, yeah. Get, claw back. Regain some, some ground. Okay. Regain some ground. Yeah. Uh, claw back some respect from, uh, the <laughs> people who are anti devil. Uh, so the devil doesn't like confession, communion, the rosary, obedience to the Pope, priests, 
and finally exorcists so the devil oh. likes yeah so the de- i mean do you like exorcists are you a fan of exorcists not really i don't like bob larson but i like bob larson yeah in that he provides me entertainment but i don't think he's a great dude i've watched a lot of bob larson's youtube videos <laughs> they're so good yeah um uh, i also am personally i'm a rosary fan yeah yeah out of all the other things on that list yeah it's it's a nice um meditation thing if you're into that sort of stuff how do you feel about obedience to the pope what do They're i say to culty. not get canceled by <laughs> <Yeah>. literally <laughs> i'm not saying the catholic church is a cult but like if obedience to one person and one person only is kind of culty see i was uh, my my gut reaction to that was well which pope <laughs> uh benedict uh francis uh. what about jp2 yeah i mean i think this was this was a pre-jp2 era so yeah and who was before that jp1 uh for like a day oh yeah i'm gonna talk about all of these popes like my thing is from the same era it's gonna be really fun 20th century was a gold mine for like (laughs) myths urban legends anyway my my impression of father ernetti is that he seems like he's like a catholic bob larson yeah I, i see that so in 1960, Father Ernetti began telling a strange story. So in this story, eight years prior, 1952, he and a colleague, Father Gametti, so it's Gametti and Ernetti, they were working on recording an archive of, Gregori- of Gregorian chants when his tape recorder began to malfunction. Father Ernetti asked God for help with his tape recorder, and the voice of God replied to him, of course I shall help you. I am always with you. Which is nice. Um, if you're trying to repair a tape recorder, God says, I got you, buddy. Well, you don't even need a patron saint of tape recorders. You just go straight up to the big guy. I mean, uh, tape recorders were, I mean, they weren't a new, new invention, but the, I think having like a personal, like a tape recorder that you could use for something like a Gregorian chant, that, that would have been f- something that was fairly new to the Catholic Church. So I don't think that there would have been a patron saint for it yet. So maybe mm. Father Ernetti could be the patron saint of tape recorders. Uh, yeah, but he'd have to be a saint. <laughs> yeah, he'd have to be, be Which a I am getting the idea that that doesn't happen for, for him. Uh, no. Um, so Fathers Ernetti and Gametti went directly. Oh, I guess it was Pope Pius Twelfth who was Pope at this okay. time. Yeah. So, uh, Pope Pius essentially tells him, don't worry about it. Type of thing happens all the time. Just go back, work on your Gregorian chant catalog. <laughs> like e- everything's fine. You know, we people hear from God all the time. Like it's it's not a big deal. You know, it's it's nice, but NBD. Father Ernetti, however, believed that this phenomenon could make a, a like a verifiable scientific like fact that could like he could use this to like verifiably and scientifically prove the existence of god that would lead millions to believe in jesus he apparently founded a scientific research institute in venice to really dial down this discovery of a tape recorder that could help him talk to and hear from god it was here that ernetti and gametti fathers ernetti and gametti enlisted the help of Enrico Fermi, the Italian physicist who had built the first ever nuclear reactor, and Werner von Braun, the rocket scientist who had created missiles for the Nazis, among others who Ernetti would not reveal the names of. Uh, This team of people worked together uh, with his Talk to God tape recorder to create the Chronovisor. So I... Uh, God on the tape recorder helped them create the chronovisor? I think they, it's unclear. I think they used the tape recorder to, like, this is a tape recorder specifically that can talk to God. So they used the parts from the tape recorder to, you haven't read, um, you haven't read his dark materials. So I'm imagining it like, you know how they would use dust to make the, dust powers the alethiometer and dust is angels. But dust can also be used to power other stuff that, you know, you, I, it's complicated. You should really go read those books. They're fantastic. That's kind of how I imagine it is. It's, it's that you take the God power from the tape recorder to put it into 
the technology that you use to make the chrono visor. Oh, God technology. Okay, gotcha. God technology. Yeah, God technology. According to Father Ernetti, the chrono visor was a device that somewhat resembled VR goggles, like Apple Vision Pro. It could be tuned to allow the viewer to observe any time and location using the time ripples left behind by those events. And you could also hear like the, the sound of those events as well, which I think I guess that's the, the tape recorder part of it. According to Ernetti, he used this device to observe speeches by Mussolini and Napoleon, as well as observing the Roman marketplace. And finally, he used this device to view the Last Supper and the crucifixion of Jesus. To prove that he had actually seen the crucifixion, Father Ernetti took a photograph of the chronovisor screen at the moment of crucifixion, claiming to show the face of Jesus as he was being crucified. And in 1965, a French magazine published a story about the chronovisor, uh, and ever since, it has been an object of interest, of urban legend, uh, something that you'd see like the History Channel talk about when they got bored of airing like Loch Ness monster documentaries. I have a I have a quick question. Go for it. Father Ernetti said that one of the things that the devil really really likes is TV because it's uh, to quote, "It is my device. I invented it." But the chronovisor has a screen? Yes. And wouldn't that be like, a, if the devil invented TV, does that mean the devil invented screens? And doesn't that mean that the chronovisor is also a satanic device? I couldn't tell you this because Father Ernetti died in 1994. But okay. my hypothesis to the answer to that question is that specifically... The devil was talking about how much he loved the programs that are on TV. Yeah, but he said it is my device. Like that's very specific. Well, I think he's more talking about like the the t like consumer, you know, television. Like that rather than just screens existing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, sure. That's that's sort of my my thought to it. I also think that Father Ernetti kind of likes the idea of taking Satan's invention and turning it against him. Okay. In the Lord of the Rings, Father Ernetti would be the guy who would say, let's take the ring to Gondor and use it to fight against Sauron and to muster armies to fight against Sauron. <laughs> this is silly. Here we get to the question, is the chronovisor real? And let's look at this critically. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. So according to Father Ernetti, he and Father Gametti uh, can both corroborate the existence of the chronovisor. Unfortunately, Father Gametti died in 1959, one year prior to Father Ernetti first coming forward with this story. Wow, that is unfortunate. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. We could have had all the corroboration that we needed in the existence of the chronovisor, but sadly, Father Gametti died. Second, Father Ernetti claims to have co-invented it with Werner von Braun and Enrico Fermi, Two inventor geniuses who had worked with the United States Defense Department. Uh, fun fact, my grandfather worked on projects with both Fermi and Von Braun. He worked on the Manhattan Project and he worked on the Saturn V moon rocket, uh, which was very interesting. My mother has a telegram that Werner Von Braun sent to my grandmother as condolences following my grandfather's death when he died in 1964. And I think he was at the funeral, but I'm not sure. Um hmm. Yeah, crazy. Also, uh, Werner von Braun knew Hitler, and he worked for Hitler, making rockets for Hitler. So, uh, Operation Paperclip, I guess. I don't know. Kind of crazy. But if two brilliant inventors were working for the United States Department of Defense at one point, and used their knowledge to create a device such as this, wouldn't it make the most sense for the United States Defense Department to take the chronovisor and use it to spy on the Russians? Yes. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, you'd know what the Soviets' battle plans were. Uh, you'd know how to stop their nuclear missiles from launching in the event that the U.S. would have a first strike. If the USSR ever received word of such an object exi existing, efforts to recover it would probably be immediate, extreme, and violent. 
So, of course, according to Ernetti, the device had been seized by the Vatican and stored there after he had invented it. And that this unique knowledge of how to make the chrono visor made it impossible for him to go anywhere without a bodyguard. I mean, apparently he did go everywhere with a bodyguard, so who knows? Yeah, and John Todd couldn't go anywhere with getting shot without getting shot at. And Alberto Rivera couldn't go anywhere without getting run off the road by the Jesuits. And uh, same with Mike Warnke. Yeah. Father Ernetti claimed to have watched a Greek play that was lost to time and that he transcribed a fraction of it. Unfortunately, when this was looked upon by es- experts, it was found that he used Latin words that were not in the Greek lexicon at the time and were not there until centuries later. Maybe he just accidentally saw a Latin play. Maybe he just he just uh, had the, the dial like a tenth of a turn off and he didn't know where he was. Yeah, and maybe it was somebody else that he saw crucified instead of Jesus because Jesus wasn't yeah. the only one that the Romans were out here crucifying. But speaking of that, remember that photo of Jesus' face that Father Ernetti says that he took? Yes, from the chronovisor. Yeah, yeah. So he took a picture of the screen from the chronovisor and, and had that published. It turns out that this was a picture of a sculpture of Jesus from a souvenir gift shop that had been flipped, uh, uh, like mirror flipped, like you go into Photoshop and say flip horizontal, and then distorted to make it more blurry. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah. And then when confronted with this evidence, Father Ernetti claims that God had showed the sculptor who made the statuette the same image that he had taken so that he could create an accurate image of Jesus. But only that one sculptor. Only that one sculptor. Out of the thousands of people who have sculpted Jesus. (laughs) Yes. It just just happened to be a lot of coincidences. (laughs) And I think the col- the sculptor was either Spanish. He was either Spanish or Portuguese, so he would still have been Catholic. So it's all kosher there. It's not like he's off showing pictures of Jesus to uh, Protestants. Um, yeah. In the and and giving the devil's them, favorite people. The devil's favorite people, or is he's not giving visions of Jesus to people who are, are you know making their King James Bible translation that's word for word perfect, right out of the word, right out of the mouth of God. Checkmate IFB. In the months leading up to his death, Father Ernetti gave one last interview in which he claimed that earlier that year, the Vatican had invited him as well as other surviving and unnamed members of the Chronovisor team to a panel made up of priests and scientists so that they could study the findings. While Father Ernetti died publicly maintaining that the Chronovisor was real, a nephew who spoke to a journalist on the condition of anonymity stated that his uncle had confessed that the chronovisor was a hoax that had spun out of control and that he had made it up so that more people would believe in Jesus and that in his later years he had been wrestling with the guilt of making such a thing up. Oh boy. Uh, I'm going to have, I have some more of these deathbed confessions for you actually in my section. I can't wait. I can't this is wait. all running together. It's really going great. To make the story even stupider, er, the Vatican <laughs> has since actually responded to the publicity of the rumors of the chronovisor, which it's surprising to me that they would even issue a degree about something this stupid, but here we are. According to the Vatican, any person who uses the chronovisor would be excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Wait, so the Vatican says... The Vatican yes, says, it's real, but you can't use it? No, the Vatican says it's not real, and if it was real, if you did use it, you would get excommunicated. Oh. Um, can you imagine? <laughs> that is the weirdest. <laughs> it's not real, but if it was real. If you ever, like, go in and look at, like, the... Ra- there are a lot of really random things that the Vatican issues decrees upon, just because it's like, why are you... At- this question is so dumb. Please, I guess we have to issue it. A- you know how some people on the internet feel like they have to have a political statement or like a personal statement about everything yes and it's not like the not like the important stuff but about like they need to make a statement about kim and kanye's divorce so that nobody thinks that they think the wrong thing about kim and kanye's divorce and their opinion is very very important the vatican can kind of be that guy sometimes with decrees the Vatican is the. Have you yeah. seen that? Or, seen I haven't that. seen. No, I've been off Twitter oh for a God, while. Stay but off the Twitter. one about like whether it's whether it's a uh, classist to drink coffee with your husband in your backyard, 
or whether you're a bad person for taking chili to your neighbors. Um, oh God, I forgot the chili, the neighborhood or, or neighbor chili one. Yeah. The Vatican is the guy who has to make a statement, either affirming or condemning bean dad. <laughs> <laughs> Remember bean dad? bean dad? Bean dad was like my first Twitter controversy when I started really using that app. Um, bean dad, the, a better way. <laughs> So here's the thing. Bean Dad wrote the uh, intro music for one of my favorite podcasts, and they ended up dropping his his intro music over that. Oh my god, that was yeah. I I think that the worst part of it isn't just like, hey, here you go, see if you can figure out how the can opener works. The worst part of it is the kid being like, I want a snack, and the dad being like, have some beans. That's not what your kid <laughs> brought. Cheese and crackers, man. Beans. Oh, yeah, like, what are we doing here? What are, like, are are you are you like a, a prepper? Are you Sadie's <laughs> prepper friend from Y Y two K? What are we What are we doing? Cheese and crackers, man, or apple slice, apples and peanut butter? Your six year old, yeah. they want us. They don't want beans, dude. That's my take on Bean Dad. I don't give a shit about any of the that's other fair. stuff. <laughs> and by the way, that's like no, three that's- years ago. So if you want to cancel me for Bean Dad, oh. I don't oh, care. God. Who cares about that anymore with the state of the world in this economy? Jesus uh, Christ. Um, I'm, I'm done making public statements about anything. Anything. But the, the Vatican is not um, because they will make a decree about the coronavirus. And um, when we come back from our break, I'm going to tell you about another thing that they made a few odd decrees about. Hold on. Uh, before we do that, I want to ask okay. you something. Can yeah. you imagine going into your confessional? Um, cause you've, you've, have you, have you done confessionally? You, you've been in the process of converting. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been in the confessional room. I have not formally done a confession yet you've, because of problems. Right. Cause you're not, you're, you're not confirmed yet. You're not allowed to. You're, right. Yeah. Is it so I can, I can do confession when I'm about to get confirmed. Can you imagine going into the confessional to talk to the priest? And the priest asks you if you've done any sins, and you told him that you used the chronovisor to look back in time to watch Wilt Chamberlain's 100 point game. See, now if I ever pick the conversion process back up, it's totally with the goal of getting to first confession so that I can tell the priest that I used a chronovisor. <laughs> no, but like, that's what I would use it for. I wouldn't use it for any other bullshit. <laughs> Be like, I because they didn't record the the 100 point game i would use it to go back in time and see uh the metallica guns and roses double headline tour um hell yeah on any night where there wasn't a riot and james hetfield didn't burn his arm off and axel rose actually went on stage so that's like like the, twice there's like yeah. two concerts that was that but it did happen i'm convinced it happened <laughs> I mean, it's it's an urban legend. People say that it happened, like Wilt's one hundred point game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, I mean, that's that's what I would watch. Uh, I would watch. I would also watch the Metallica Guns and Roses double headliner. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, if I ever get back on that conversion thing, I'll uh, let you know what happens. Yeah, uh, when who I confess knows? to using a chronovisor. I don't want you to get excommunicated. So, I that would be pretty. I don't know. I feel like that'd be pretty badass. <laughs> It would be the quickest, like confirmation and then excommunication in the history of ah, it's a loophole. Because if I confess before I'm confirmed, then I'm not actually a Catholic and they can't excommunicate me. This is a great plan. Wait, isn't excommunicate like excommunication isn't like a formal process? It's just the priest saying, "I won't give you communion." Right? No, it is both of it is either of those things or both of those things. So when it's a formal process, it comes from the top. It comes from the Vatican, and nobody's allowed to give you communion. You can be like there's there's some butthole in like Boston or something that won't give Biden communion because he's too pro-abortion or whatever. Right? No, because Nancy Pelosi Pelosi has had this run into the same problem. They can't receive in their own home area, but they can get communion with any priest that will give it to them because they are not excommunicated from the top. They're just denied communion by that one guy. Right. Cause Pelosi got the, the priest wouldn't give her communion. And so she went to Rome and got it from the Pope, which <laughs> is kind of a baller move. If you can do it, yeah. 
but not to stand politicians because I don't really, I'm not really a fan of standing politicians in general. Let's go to break and then we can talk about the final Christian hoax that Sadie has been like chomping at the bit to get into ever since we started this episode. So let's do it. I'm so excited. Hey there, my name's Nate Hansen, and for years I was a worship leader, I was planting churches with Francis Chan, who's a New York Times best-selling Christian author, and then I started to question what I was teaching. Why am I teaching about hell so much? Why am I trying to motivate people to follow Jesus because of the fear of God? This led me to deconstruct everything, and I started a podcast called Almost Heretical, where my wife, Shelby, who's a Bible scholar, feminist scholar, and I unpack the Reformed fundamentalist, evangelical ideas that we used to teach. And we talked to guests like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Rain Wilson and others about Christianity, God, spirituality, and how we should think about all this. So if you feel alone, if you feel crazy, if you feel like you're the only one questioning and leaving behind past ideas about God, the Bible, search for Almost Heretical in your podcast player. We'd love to go on this journey with you. We are back from our break. Sadie, what are you talking to us about now? So I threw around a couple of ideas on what other hoax I wanted to cover on this episode. And I thought about maybe doing the Shroud of Turin, or I thought about doing Heaven is for Real. Um, And then I remembered Padre Pio, and I thought this would actually be a great one because I have gone back and forth a lot on how I feel about certain Catholic mystics, saints, or miracle workers. And Padre Pio is one that I really don't have a settled opinion on. Um, I don't feel really attached to a conclusion about Padre Pio. And as I researched it more, it turned out to be even more interesting than I thought it would be. And it brought up this new theory that I've never heard before that I think ties the whole episode together. And I am so excited. Okay. Mm. Padre Pio was a well-known priest in Italy. He served from his 20s to a very old age, from 1910 to 1968, and he was purportedly a mystic and, most importantly, a stigmatist. But I will get to the stigmata. What's a stigmatist? Stigmata is... A stigmatist is somebody who has stigmata. Stigmata is not a phenomenon limited to Padre Pio. It's been reported by many Catholic mystics, visionaries, and highly religious people. Stigmata is wounds appearing on a person's body, particularly their hands, feet, forehead, and sometimes left side that appear similar to the wounds recorded from Jesus's crucifixion. So it would look like puncture wounds in the hands or feet or a crown of thorns on the person's head or a cut on their side. Some notable saints, such as St. Francis Assisi or St. Catherine, were reported to exhibit stigmata. And before I go any further, I do want to give a trigger warning for self-harm, eating disorders, mental health. You'll see why. So stigmata is heavily connected to mysticism. So people that I think I've talked about, oh, I think it was St. Teresa Avila, but I'm not sure, uh, on this podcast, who was a Catholic mystic who had like visions and experiences with Jesus in her mind, uh, or even like the Fatima children. That's mysticism. Stigmata and mysticism are almost always connected, but stigmata and poor physical health are also almost always connected. Hmm. Almost every stigmatist is someone who has experienced serious physical health problems, and almost every stigmatist can also be associated with mental health struggles as well. For example, I'm going to read a quote about this later, but many stigmatists go into ecstasy or have a vision when receiving Eucharist, which could be seen as a sign of great religious devotion, but also seems a lot like a manic phase or a moment Hmm. of extreme mania. Many stigmatists also report symptoms similar to depression. So they tell you, I'm suffering with Jesus. I'm feeling the agony of the cross when they lie in bed for weeks or months at a time. Padre Pio was a stigmatist. Um, He expressed from a very young age that he wanted to enter holy orders and give his life totally to God. He was from a very devout and religious Catholic family. His family was devoted to frequently attending mass and saying the rosary together as a family. Padre Pio uh, suffered a lot of health problems as a child, including typhoid fever. 
he also claimed to experience religious visions, prophetic visions from a very young age. He grew up. His family made sacrifices for him to be able to join religious orders as a Franciscan monk, and then he was later ordained a priest. He continued to have serious health problems throughout his young adulthood and really throughout his life, and continued to report mystic religious visions and prophecies throughout his life. Uh, he claimed that the stigmata bleeding wounds in his hands appeared first in, around 1915, but he prayed and asked God to take them away because he was so embarrassed by them. But they came back in September of 1918 and never went away. Padre mm. Pio would often wear gloves, like fingerless gloves, to cover the stigmata on his hands. He said that he was very embarrassed by it. Um, looking at this from a religious point of view, uh, oh, he was so humbled by having the imprint of God on his flesh and knowing that he was an unworthy human being. That, that that humility brought great embarrassment to him. Looking at it from a non-religious perspective, if you keep your hands covered half the time, you don't have to bleed half the time. That's true. So stigmatics, it's connected to mysticism, poor physical health, poor mental health. And this is, again, TW for eating disorder. Many stigmatics also exhibit the quote-unquote miracle of being able to subsist without food or water other than the host and wine at Eucharist, at Mass. The number of days that a person is able to do this and stay alive is seen as proof of their holiness, which does not strike me as good uh, at all. There are stigmatists who only eat and drink at Eucharist and then lose a bunch of weight and get really sickly, which is what you would expect to happen if somebody was receiving very little nutrition. And then there are stigmatists that claim to only eat and drink at Eucharist um, and are just praying in their private room for a couple hours a day where nobody can see them and they don't lose any weight. And that's a miracle too, because God is sustaining them. God is sustaining them. They, they don't have a bag of Doritos up in their priest robes in their- They say they have, they uh, have beans in a can opener under the bed. <laughs> beans in a can opener, just like Bean Dad. Yeah. Or so, the preppers. Um, Padre Pio did at times only eat and drink at mass. He exhibited open bleeding wounds in the palms of his hands for almost 50 years. They always appeared fresh and not infected and usually actively bleeding. Padre Pio gained a reputation for many other miracles, such as levitation, bilocation, which is being able to be in two places at once, healing miracles, being able to read people's hearts and see their inner secrets and sins. A, a lot of these, weirdly, a lot of stigmatists also purportedly levitate. I wasn't able to quite put those pieces together, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Hmm. The church under several different popes was very skeptical of Padre Pio. For quite a while, his license to perform the duties of a priest was suspended while the church performed multiple medical and psychiatric evaluations of him. Padre Pio was examined by several doctors. One doctor said his wounds were exactly what he would expect to see from someone who was hurting themselves and creating these wounds with something like carbolic acid which was apparently a thing that soldiers in World War I did to get out of service, according to this doctor. And this is literally really? five years after World War I came to an end. Huh. A nearby pharmacist in the village where Padre Pio lived claimed that she sold Padre Pio carbolic acid and massive amounts of veritrine, which is a caustic alkaloid substance. But Padre Pio claimed that he just bought those things to play a prank on someone not to make stigmata in his hands. One doctor believed that Padre Pio's stigmata were 100% real and from Jesus and not self-inflicted. Another doctor was really not sure. And then all the other doctors theorized that these wounds were self-created by carbolic acid and or iodine. For the rest of Padre Pio's life, he attracted a huge group of followers and he still has many online devotees today. For the rest of his life, the church went back and forth on how they felt about him, sometimes denouncing him, sometimes praising him. It, it was really whether he was popular with the guy who was currently pope or not, because some popes liked him and then others didn't. 
Some church officials, including Pope John the Twenty Third, accused Padre Pio of having inappropriate sexual relationships with women. Multiple church officials believed that. And other church officials believed that Padre Pio was a totally, he was not a bad guy at all. He was just a very simple-minded person who was being controlled by others who wanted a piece of his, his power and fame. Like, he just doesn't know what he's doing and his handlers are at fault. Eventually, the, ch the church totally reversed course, formally retracted all accusations against Padre Pio, and officially made him a saint in 2002. And now you can buy little bits of his blood rags that he used to cover up the stigmata in his hands on eBay. Which is how I found out about him in the first place. <laughs> oh, was this back when you were researching the, the I wasn't researching relics? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't really researching anything. I just wanted to see what parts of dead people you could buy on eBay. <laughs> That is such a Sadie thing to do, and that is such a not me thing to do. That must have been back in when we were talking about, like, I remember it must have been like the first 10 episodes or something we were talking oh, yeah. about saints and stuff. Because I was talking about relics. relics. And yeah. I, I revisit it because I'm, I'm interested, like, I have a special interest in, in corrupt saints and supposedly in corrupt saints and St. Carlo Acuta, um, Acuta and like other the specific saints that I just think are fun. <laughs> and, I found a bunch of pieces of Padre Pio on eBay, and I thought, huh, who was this guy? And then I started doing a bunch of research about him, and I've always wanted to talk about him on the show and just have not gotten to it until now. But there's a particular reason I wanted to bring him up in this episode. Theories about stigmata often fall into two very distinct categories. Either, yes, it's real, it's a sign from God for holy people to bring more people to Jesus, or it's totally fake and people are doing it to themselves to get attention and fame and they don't really care about Jesus at all. But looking into Padre Pio and some other stigmatists actually brought me to a new theory that I think is more helpful. There have been some reliably debunked stigmatists throughout history, including Magdalena de la Cruz, who was a 16th century nun and abbess. She was considered a saint within her lifetime because she supposedly performed miracles and she exhibited stigmata. Later in life, she visited Pope Paul III and confessed that she had sex with the devil, and the devil gave her the stigmata and the means to perform miracles in the devil's name so that she could gain power. But now wow. she felt really bad about her having sex with the devil and taking his power, and she wanted to confess to the Pope, and the Pope sentenced her to a life in a convent with no means of regaining power. And, and tell me that doesn't sound like a mental health thing. <laughs> Uh, that's 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 a wild story to go to the pope and say hey i had sex with the devil and he gave me magic powers yeah uh i had sex with the devil he gave me magic powers and put holes in my hands so that everybody would believe that i was from jesus but it was a lie and i feel really bad about it and the pope says okay i believe you i'm sentencing you to go off in this convent and the pope is like yeah i believe you just stay away from the devil uh for <laughs> for the time like for you know for the foreseeable future and don't do it again, and we'll be cool. That's I mean, it was, it was it was the 1500s. But that, to me, that sounds like somebody who had a some kind of um, not a, an experience not based in reality, and believed it. Like I, this doesn't seem like a bad person to me. This seems like a mentally ill person. There's this other stigmatist, um, Gemma, Gemma Galgani, who was a rough contemporary of Padre Pio, early 20th century. She was pretty reliably accused of causing her own wounds with a sewing needle. But I actually want to read what she wrote about one of her own mystic experiences. Quoting from Gemma Galgani, the Blessed Virgin Mary opened her mantle and covered me with it. At that very moment, Jesus appeared with his wounds all open. Blood was not flowing from them, but flames of fire, which in one moment came and touched my hands, feet, and heart. I felt I was dying and should have fallen down, but for my mother, Blessed Virgin Mary, who supported me and kept me under her mantle. Thus I remained for several hours. Then my mother kissed my forehead, the vision disappeared, and I found myself on my knees. But I still had a keen pain in my hands, feet, and heart. I got up to get into bed and saw that blood was coming from the places where I had the pain. I covered them as well as I could and then helped by my guardian angel got into bed. Gemma 
was it was examined by her doctor who had been her doctor since before she began exhibiting uh, stigmata or or any kind of religious mysticism. And her doctor, who had known her her whole life, used the word neurosis to describe what he thought was going on with her. This was the mid-1900s. They didn't have the diagnoses that we have now. But it's been theorized that stigmatists like Magdalena and like Gemma could have had anything from a major anxiety disorder to schizophrenia to OCD. And that really tracks. Like, that really, really tracks. So the new theory that I think applies remarkably well to cases of stigmatists that I've discussed today is that it is not necessarily all true or all a lie. The person who is stuff suffering or exhibiting stigmata could 100% believe that it is real and a sign from God because they could be self-inflicting these wounds without their own knowledge. One writer theorized that this person's having a very, very intense religious experience. They are imagining that they feel the pain of crucifixion wounds because of this intense religious experience that they're happening. They're having. And in their like out of body religious experience, which I have certainly had, um, they believe that they're feeling the pain of the crucifixion. So they scratch at the spot where they think the pain is and that causes them to bleed but they were so caught up in whatever was happening to them, whether you want to call it a mental health crisis or religious ecstasy or both at the same time, that they truly did not know they did it to themselves. And I would put Gemma Galgani firmly in this category. I think reading Gemma's story, I think she didn't know she was doing it to herself, especially given the testimony from her own doctor who had known her her whole life. I think that's a really good guess. That makes sense to me. So, and, and Padre Pio, in other things that I've read about him, there was a question of, did he acquire these wounds somehow and then try to keep them clean with iodine and carbolic acid? And he didn't know that he was perpetuating them staying with him for his entire life. Right. Because that's what, what I'm thinking is that, <clears throat> I mean, I remember falling down on the playground at school and getting iodine on the, you know, when you skin your knee and they put iodine on it, it burns like a mother. Yeah. But that's a thing that they do to, to disinfect stuff. Right. So if Padre Pio was really as. They, he's portrayed by a lot of people, even certain church officials, as being very, just not a book smart person, just very simple, very single minded, uh, very plain person. And if that's true, couldn't he have gotten these wounds somehow? Maybe he scratched himself and, and didn't know or somehow otherwise acquired these wounds and then tried to clean them with carbolic acid or iodine not knowing that he was creating his own stigmata. Do we know if there is like a neurological effect of iod of like too much iodine in the bloodstream? Like if you use iodine on your wounds too much, will it affect your mental health? I don't know. I don't think he's supposed your, to hang your on cognitive abilities some way. Iodine overdose. Like yeah. It, mild iodine toxicity. GI upset, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, diarrhea, delirium, stupor, and shock. Hmm. Interesting. So that's possible too. Yeah, it is. So that's one idea that I think is really plausible. The other new theory that I pulled up doing this research is that what if some of these stigmatists knew that the stigmata were not real? but they believed that the stigmata had the power to draw people to God. So basically their logic was God will forgive me for my sin of lying because I will convert so many people and help so many people with this. And this just took me straight back to Jack Scott. God will forgive me of my sin of sexual abuse because I gave so much money to missions and converted so many people. But Jack Scott, I don't see as sincere in that belief. While I can see much more pos possibility 
for Padre Pio being sincere, if the psychiatrist evaluations he went through were correct, that's another totally plausible theory. So how does this apply to the plethora of other Christian hoaxes? And this is what really opened my mind and gave me a whole new perspective on Christian hoaxes. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about the chronovisor. Yes. How many of these are perpetuated not by outright fakers and cheats and liars, but by people who have a pretty good sense that what they're reporting isn't strictly true, But they justify and rationalize it with the thought that, well, it's going to glorify God and convert people. How many of the people who claim that their brother's nephew and his girlfriend picked up Jesus on the highway weren't liars or true believers? How many of those people fell in between? Or people who, I don't know, maybe they're in an IFB scenario and they're under extreme pressure to get their soul winning numbers up. And so they're thinking, maybe I have to resort to something that's a little bit duplicitous and a little bit showman-y to get... But if the person gets saved, it's okay. If the person gets saved, it's okay. I'm under pressure to do it. And I mean, Jack Hiles threw filet of fish out of a helicopter. So who are we to Mm -hmm. say that, you know, me telling a tall tale, like, is such a bad thing to have happen? Yeah. I mean, like, it's, I mean, some of it could be people who are under pressure to do things that are impossible to do. And so they, the only way that they can accomplish that is through falsehoods or or through duplicitous means, or it could be, you know, maybe the Homer Simpsons of the world who are just kind of looking for an easy way out. And they, you know, and they never make a a larger plan to try to be evil, but things just spiral out of control (laughs) and they're. And I think what I had just never quite put together was all of the different space and all of the different options between liar and true believer when it comes to these hoax, these hoaxes. And it makes me think of my dad preaching about the well to hell hoax. I know he preached about it and I'm pretty sure he played the audio in our church growing up and he's not here and I can't ask him, but I have to wonder if maybe that was a case of a willing blind spot. It would really answer a lot of questions. Well, I don't know if this is true, but it comes from a source that I agree with. And I can always, you know, if it comes out that this is fake, I can always say, look, they told me it was okay. They told me that like it's, it gives you some level of plausible deniability. And I feel like I remember him qualifying, like, we don't know, we don't know for sure, but this is the story or something like that. And it really answers a lot of questions about how my dad and other intelligent people came to spread some of these hoaxes. It it just opened my mind because it's a new couple, new options that are not fake and liar or someone who just wholeheartedly believes the hoax. That there could be people who know on some level that it's probably not true, but allow themselves to believe it and spread it because they think it's for the best and because they morally justify it. And I think that goes right back to Chronovisor. Yeah. Because he took a a fake picture of a statuette of Jesus from a gift shop and then said it was from the screen of the Chronovisor from the crucifixion because he wanted to scientifically prove that God and the Bible and all of it was real. Right. And I I assume that he just wanted to have an article go out there and say, science proves that the the crucifixion really happened because they looked back in time and everyone would say, oh, gee, golly whiz, that sounds great. I guess I'm going to become a Christian now. I'm going to convert to Catholicism. Right. And no one's going to ask any further questions. And he just didn't think about the next steps where they're going to say, okay, can you replicate this result? And he says, no, but here's a picture I took. Trust me. (laughs) Right. Or just, I mean, it's almost like the thing that it reminds me of and where I think that like where a lot of these hoaxes are going to get started now is, I mean, do you follow like, am I the asshole and and stories like that on Reddit? I mean, I I read about stories like that on the internet and some of them you're like, oh, this person, am I the asshole because my sister, because for, for blowing up my sister's wedding, because I thought X, Y, Z thing happened and they were being, and some of these stories, they seem believable, but some of them they're like, okay, there's no way this story is real. But then there's a whole like cottage industry of people who take, am I the asshole stories from Reddit and turn them into TikToks and then get their TikTok account gets, you know, blown up from putting Minecraft parkour videos over am I the asshole stories being read by a robot voice and they get money from doing that. And so it's just like, 
is it real? Well, it doesn't even matter anymore, but somebody believes it. Somebody's going to hear it and somebody's going to listen to it and think that this is what's going on in society. Yeah. So I think that ties back into everything we mentioned in this episode. And it, it just makes so much sense when you think about the different, the different options that there are for why somebody would spread something like this, for why somebody would believe something that like this for any, I think anything that I can do, the stereotype is that people like me who were born and raised in this kind of group are stupid and naive because I once believed in the well to hell hoax. Um, of course I did. I was a child and being told that it was true. But I think this is the work that helps dispel that idea that I was somehow stupid for believing this as a little child. Because it it explains how these things got spread with sincerity. It explains why I would believe it. It explains why these stories got started. And it, it makes it make sense to me. And it makes me feel a lot better. And I hope it does other people too. I mean, I've been taken in by myths before. I've been taken in by um, either propaganda or false uh you know, false stories, hoaxes and stuff. Everybody has. Everybody listening to this show, I'm sure, has at some point in their life. And I know I have. So are we saying that we're all stupid and we're all idiots? No, the idea is that we're all fallible. And it's not. And, you know, you always have to be critical of whatever it is you're hearing and, and what you're consuming, um, even if it's coming from a source that you think is trusted. Mm -hmm. Go back to the source. That's that's so interesting. Um so I guess that's all there is today, unless you have any final thoughts to add no, on I, to that. Um, no, I really enjoyed this one, but I don't have any final thoughts beyond that. That was a fun episode to do. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, I think next week is when our consumerism episode is coming out. Uh, and then after that, I think we're getting into the book of Revelations. So that should be a ton of fun. Uh, TW mega tw in advance for all of the talk about the book of revelations that we're going to have because i know that's triggering to a lot of people but that'll be a lot of fun um and this is something we've been looking forward to doing for years so cool thank you guys for tuning in leaving eden podcast follow us on facebook and instagram at leaving eden podcast um you can follow me on social media at on i think i'm just on instagram now and i post pictures of food and cats and that's it. But you can follow me at G A V R I E L H A C O H E N. Sadie, your socials. You can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music and on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You guys have a great time. Great day. Bye bye. Yeah.